Hello everyone and welcome back to another reaction video. Today we are taking a look at Epic History TV's guide to the HMS Victory, one of the greatest warships ever. Um, and uh, although I'm not an expert on naval warfare or naval history, I do believe I have some comments to contribute. Uh, and um, yeah, let's see what we got here. And without further ado, let's get going. 1805. Britain is at war with France. When is that not the case is the question, though. Uh, at this point, England, Great Britain, United Kingdom has been at war with France on and off for uh, at least 500 years. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> the greater question would be, when is... Uh, England not at war with France. The French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte will soon dominate mainland Europe. Yep. But at sea, Britain's Royal Navy reigns supreme. That year, Napoleon wins one of his greatest victories against the Russians and Austrians at Austerlitz. But six weeks earlier, off the coast of Spain, the British win a battle of much more lasting strategic significance. Off Cape Trafalgar, the Royal Navy inflicts a crushing defeat on the combined fleet of France and Spain. Yes, uh, the Battle of Trafalgar suddenly had much more strategic consequence than the Battle of Austerlitz did. And... Uh, Nelson managed to pull off a absolutely brilliant victory against the Franco-Spanish fleet. The Franco-Spanish fleet was bigger, and they also had the uh, Santissima Trinidad, the absolutely uh, the most fearsome warship ever built. Uh, I believe after its refit, it had like 136 guns, and that's more guns than any other in the Age of Sail. So it was a super impressive warship that was captured and uh, subsequently uh, scuttled by the British. Now, Lord Nelson, uh, Vice Admiral Nelson, managed to win this by defying uh, naval tactical orthodoxy by sailing directly into the battle line of the Franco-Spanish fleet, thereby dividing them from each other. And, uh, yeah. Even uh, Admiral Villeneuve, the French commander, had predicted that something like that might happen, but he didn't take any precautions to prevent it. And so, um, yes, the Battle of Trafalgar will cement uh, Britain's naval supremacy for the rest of the Napoleonic Wars, and even beyond. Enemy losses are devastating. Yes, I believe... Uh, the losses for the Franco-Spanish fleet is 21 ships of the line, which is absolutely devastating. I don't believe the British lost a single ship. And there were uh, many thousands uh, captured, wounded and killed. And uh, yeah, so this was an absolutely crushing defeat. British naval superiority will not be seriously challenged again for the rest of the war. Britain goes on to play a leading role in Napoleon's eventual defeat. Its greatest contribution, its wooden walls, the Royal Navy. Britain is the world's largest naval power. With 136 ships of the line and 110,000 men at sea. Yes, it is certainly the biggest fleet in the world, the most advanced fleet in the world, and it has the most experienced crews in the world, and it's not even close. Uh, France does command the second largest navy in the world at this time, but uh, there are various things that have hampered the French navy, not least the fact that the revolution um, proved to be a great disruption in terms of what sort of leadership was available to the French Navy. 
uh, most of the Navy leadership was uh, nobility. And of course, we all know what happened to them after the revolution. And then there was chaos in the organization and administration of the French fleet, uh, uh, French Navy, that proved uh, very destructing, uh, to say the least. Still, at this point, uh, at the start of the revolution, France has access to about 80 ships of the line in various classes. And that's not bad at all. But uh, yeah, outclassed and outgunned by the British in every sense. The Navy protects the homeland from invasion. It allows Britain to project force into Europe with raids and expeditionary forces. It cuts off enemy trade while protecting Britain's own. It yes, um, so the Royal Navy is the only reason Napoleon was not able to land troops in Britain. Because if he had managed to land some troops in Britain, there is no doubt in my mind that Napoleon would have emerged victorious, because at this point in 1801-1802, when this was seriously being considered, the French army is the most experienced land army in the world, and it has brilliant leadership with Napoleon at its head, with his uh, various able generals. And so um, it was absolutely critical for the outcome of the entire war that Britain was not knocked out prematurely or knocked out at all. And of course, um, then we have the famous trade war between France and Britain during this time uh, with Napoleon trying his continental system. We have talked about that in the Napoleonic War series, so I won't go into more detail here. But then we also have Britain, who is able to cut off French trade with its uh, colonial possessions. Um, and, uh, and we all know that the colonial possessions were very profitable indeed, especially the sugar islands uh, that were in uh, sugar and spice islands that were in the possession of both France and Spain, who was an ally of France at this time. So, uh, and it also allowed Britain, of course, to continue to trade unmolested overseas with its own colonial possessions, which brought much financial gain to Britain, and uh, they needed it in order to sustain this war against Napoleon, which proved to be extremely costly, to say the least. Isolates and seizes overseas colonies, including the vastly profitable sugar islands of the West Indies. It undermines enemy economies, while allowing Britain to use its own financial strength to sustain its allies. Oh yeah, if you don't know, Britain loves to do this in the Napoleonic Wars. They basically uh, finance the coalition's armies at this point. Uh, it would not have been possible for Austria and Prussia and Russia to keep so many men in field for so long without British financial support. It, it doesn't happen without it. In two decades of war with France, Britain wins a series of naval battles that ensure it can carry out. Yeah, um, these are some of the most famous battles of this time. The most important one being Trafalgar, of course. But then we have the Battle of the Nile, which uh, sort of cut off Napoleon's uh, army, which had, uh, which was at this time performing its expedition into Egypt and uh, and Lower Palestine. So. Um, that would prove to be quite meddlesome. I'm sure we'll hear more about this uh, particular battle during the uh, Epic History TV's uh, forthcoming Egyptian campaign retelling of Napoleon's uh, story there. And then we also have the Battle of Cape St. Vincent, which was an absolutely brilliant victory by Admiral uh, Jarvis. Uh, Admiral Jarvis, sorry. And uh, I believe Epic History TV is also going to cover this battle. And that's where he had 15 ships of the line against 25 Spanish ships of the line. And he managed to pull off a brilliant victory there. So the Britain, Britain's got a track record to back up uh, its uh, naval reputation. These war-winning strategies effectively. Among the Royal Navy's most formidable warships, 
HMS Victory, a first-rate ship of the line, the most powerful class of warship afloat. 104 guns, 820 men. Yeah, that's a 104 guns on a ship. A single ship is a absolutely stupid uh, amount of firepower. A single broadside from Victory packs more weight of iron than every gun in Wellington's army at Waterloo. This is Epic History TV's guide to a legend. To be fair, though, uh, Wellington didn't have an inordinate amount of artillery available at Waterloo, but it's still impressive nonetheless. A Napoleonic warship. Today, HMS Victory lies in dry dock in Portsmouth, on England's south coast. A famous visitor attraction and the world's oldest commissioned warship. Yeah, that's a fun fact about uh, uh, the HMS Victory. It is still commissioned as an active warship. Obviously, it's not being used anymore, but still, it's a sort of an honorary thing um, that the British Navy still has kept it in service, uh, even if it's just a formality. She's a remarkable survivor from a vanished world of sail-powered warships oh, yes. and global struggles between Europe's great empires. Yeah, HMS Victory is one of the last great warships in the Age of Sail. Uh, probably the greatest uh, warship in the Age of Sail, uh, if you want to be that forward. Uh, because in well, by the end of the Napoleonic Wars, and maybe at 50, 75 years onwards, we were going to see uh, the ironclad ships start to appear in the mid 19th century, which will gradually start to replace the uh, old uh, majestic uh, ships of the line. And of course, by the turn of the century, we will get the, the, the destroyer class and the battleship class of warships, the modern ones that we all know and Maybe we don't all love them, but uh, uh, yeah. So this is truly the last hurrah for the aid, the sail-powered ships. Victory was built to boost British naval power at the height of one of these struggles, the Seven Years' War. The Seven Years' War is one of those forgotten conflicts which proved absolutely pivotal in the mid-18th century. And it uh, helped cement Britain's role as a global power uh, alongside the really birth of the powerful Prussian state that would eventually form Germany. So it was a crucial conflict that has been forgotten in many sense. Now, Britain's role during this war was uh, mostly on the high seas and in the col colonies. Uh, but there was a huge war going on in Central Europe at the time. But uh, I'm sure we'll have ample reason to come back to the Seven Years' War in the future. Construction began at Chatham Royal Dockyard in 1759. It's ironic, but um, Lord Nelson was born in 17, uh, uh, 1759 or 1758. So... Uh, <laughs> it's quite ironic, isn't it? She was designed by Sir Thomas Slade, the foremost British naval architect of the age. Sir Thomas Slade is uh, considered by contemporaries to be a um, unmatched genius when it comes to naval architecture. And even his successors admitted themselves that Sir Thomas Slade was unmatched in his abilities to design and construct um, exemplary warships. And uh, Sir Thomas Slade came up with uh, several generic uh, warship designs. Of course, we have the HMS Victory, the most famous of his designs, but we also have less known uh, gunships like um, the Dublin class, which possessed uh, 74 guns. It's a third rate ship of the line. And we also have the um, Ardent class, a 64-gun ship of the line. 
So uh, he brought forth many designs and innovations to the Royal Navy and uh, rightfully has been acknowledged uh, in the history books. Around 6,000 trees went into victory. Absolutely. 6,000 trees. Can you imagine? I mean, try to imagine 6,000 trees in front of you or above, you know, looking down on 6,000 trees. That's, uh, that's an awful lot of trees. And uh, it's a really impressive uh, piece of, uh, well, a piece of war. But uh, it's almost like art, isn't it? As such a gracious design can come out of 6,000 trees. British oak, though her lower masts were originally New England pine. Mm. Her keel was elm, her upper masts and yards more flexible fir and spruce. The result, launched in 1765, was soon considered a masterpiece. A ship bristling with firepower, with the speed and handling of a much lighter vessel. Yeah, that's uh, sort of what uh, makes HMS Victory such a good warship, really. It uh, had an enormous amount of firepower, but a handling, uh, its handling and speed was uh, unprecedented for its size and for being a first-rate ship of the line. They're usually known as being like these sluggish beasts with a lot of firepower. But uh, Victory proved to be quite a, a agile ship considering its size. Victory was not completed in time to take part in the Seven Years' War. She first saw action 13 years later in the American War of Independence, leading the capture of a French convoy off Ushant. When the Revolutionary Wars broke out against France, HMS Victory was the British flagship at the Allied blockade of Toulon. Yes, and who was it that managed to lift the Allied blockade of Toulon? Well, none other than our good old friend uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. At that time, he held the rank of Major. He was the newly graduated artillery officer. And uh, Toulon is where he made his name. It's how he got promoted to Brigadier General. And that put him on a fast track to glory and greatness. So it's interesting how these fates are tied together. Then in 1797, she was Admiral Jarvis's flagship at his great victory over the Spanish at Cape St. Vincent. Victory was by then 32 years old, far beyond her life expectancy of 18 years. Yeah, that's the problem with designing weapons of war, isn't it? And technology evolves, and often it evolves more, far more rapidly than one imagines. And we still have this problem today where uh, you design a new fighter jet, for example, you expect it to be in service for 20, 25, 30 years, and you don't know how technology will evolve by then. And something greater, more innovative, more technologically advanced and superior in every way usually comes around. And, well, then you usually decide to get rid of the old and get in the new. But uh, sometimes it can be saved uh, thanks to some technological innovations, which I believe is the case with Victor. Worn out, she was briefly threatened with being turned into one of Britain's notorious prison ships, known as Hulks. No one would have guessed that her greatest hour still lay ahead of her. Because at the last minute, Victory was reprieved and began a major three-year refit that cost more than she did to build. Yeah, the Revolutionary Wars and the Napoleonic Wars came at a time... Um, well, it was fortunate for victory because those two conflicts uh, require more of the Royal Navy. And rather than build a new first-rate ship of the line from scratch, why not just reprieve an old one, upgrade it a bit, and put it out to sail again? She returned to service in 1803 as Vice Admiral Nelson's flagship. Two years later, she would lead the British attack at Trafalgar and win her place in naval legend.
by the Napoleonic Wars, a first-rate ship of the line was the world's largest and most sophisticated weapon of war, and it needed a huge crew to work efficiently. In 1805, Victory's complement was around 820. That's about a regimental size. Uh, a regiment is about a thousand men, a thousand and one thousand five hundred men. So it, yeah, that's not small at all. That's a, quite a crew there. Every man and boy with his designated role. From the admiral of the fleet to the ship's captain, naval lieutenants and marine officers, midshipmen, warrant officers, clerks and stewards, petty officers and their mates, sailors of the able, ordinary and landlubber variety, Royal Marines, right down to the 31 ship's boys. In many ways, the organization of a warship is very similar to a land regiment or land army's uh, organization. We have the admiral and equivalent would, the, would be the general uh, or a marshal or Napoleon himself, perhaps. And the captain, we could have a subordinate general. We have clerks and stewards. Um, Napoleonic armies, especially those of France, um, was accompanied by a, a vast swath of um, civilian clerks who ensured the in administration uh, of the army was efficiently running. And uh, yeah, so we, it's very similar to how a, a land army or land regiment would be structured with the various subdivisions of command. So, um, yeah, but it is a warship, so I guess that's not too strange. Before we examine HMS Victory's arrangement and structure, a quick reminder of some common nautical terms. The right side of the ship, starboard. The left side of the ship, larboard, which only became port in 1844 to reduce confusion. I think that was a good change. Uh, larboard, starboard, you, you can easily get those confused. Port is uh, much more distinct. The back of the ship, her stern. The front, her stem. Towards the stern was aft or abaft. Towards the stem was forward or fore. Victory's middle gun deck was 186 feet long. The top of her main mast was 205 feet above the waterline. Victory's top speed was 10 knots, or 11. Yeah, I, I like that the, um, uh, for us on the more advanced and civilized metric system, we would like uh, something described in meters and kilometers and miles per hour. Well, so that makes it easier to understand the scale of this ship. <laughs> I am not a fan of the imperial system that the, the Americans and the British still use. 7.5 miles per hour, fast for a ship her size. In 1780, she received the latest British naval innovation, copper sheathing for her hull. This protected her timbers from shipworm, barnacles and weeds, keeping her solid and streamlined. Victory, like all ships of the line, was ship-rigged, meaning she had three masts. A foremast, mainmast and mizzenmast, and a bowsprit. Each mast was made up of sections. The lower mast, secured deep in the ship's hold, rose up through the decks to the fighting top, which served as a platform for sharpshooters in battle. Above it, the top mast. Then the cross trees, which secured the top gallant mast, pronounced to gallant. The cross trees was the lookout's position, there being no crow's nests in the Navy. Each mast supported. I think that is a common misunderstanding. There were lookouts, but there were no real crow's nests that people could sit in. In several yards to which the sails were fastened or bent. Victory's rigging. Yeah, the amount of rigging going on in this ship is uh, pretty astonishing, really. Uh, how many ropes and levers and pulleys. And then you have to put up all the sails that uh, a warship of this size could uh, use. And uh, it starts to become a really comp 
complicated operation going on here. And uh, you can see why having, having an experienced crew here could really help out. 26 miles of rope and Whoa. 786 26 miles came in two types. St That's kind of hard to wrap your head around, really. Standing rigging gave structural support to the masts. Forestays and backstays kept them braced fore and aft. The shrouds secured the masts laterally, and their rope steps, called ratlins, were how you climbed the masts. Experienced seamen reached the tops by climbing the futter shrouds. On a rolling sea, this could mean climbing out over the ocean upside down. So novices were advised. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> to use the lubber's hole. Yeah, that sounds good enough. The other type of rigging was running rigging, used to operate the ship's yards and sails, and included halyards, bowlines, and clue lines. Victory had 37 sails with which to harness the power of the wind, her only real form of propulsion. They had a total area of 6,500 square yards, about the size of a football pitch. Though yeah, again, the scale of things going, in, uh, going on in this ship is uh, absolutely bonkers, <laughs> to use a, a term. <laughs> Not all sails could be set together nor did more sail necessarily mean more speed. Her large square sails included the fore course, fore top sail, pronounced topsail, and fore top gallant sail, pronounced fore to garnsail. On the main mast, the main course, main topsail, and main to garnsail. Seems logical enough. The mizzen mast carried a fore and aft rigged sail known as a spanker or driver as well as mizzen topsail and mizzen tagansail, while the bowsprit could carry a variety of fore and aft rigged sails, most commonly a jib and flying jib. Another 11 fore and aft rigged sails, known as staysails, could also be set. Victory's upper deck, or weather deck, was actually several decks, the foc'sle, waist, quarter deck, and poop deck. The forecastle is a shortened form of forecastle, a term dating back to the Middle Ages when warships carried raised fighting platforms at both ends. Yeah, that's uh, pretty interesting that uh, the term stuck, and uh, we have many examples of that in history where, where terms that don't really apply anymore still just, you know, they're still around, uh, used, and um, not many people really understand the original meaning anymore. But yes, uh, this is a medieval term, who, which uh, he just explained why. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Romans, uh, they, they were also um, fond of using uh, different sort of innovations to get uh, a advantage when it came to melee combat on the oceans. And, uh, well, I suppose it was the same in, during the Middle Ages. Uh, boarding parties are eternal. The folks all housed the belfry, containing the all-important ship's bell, rung regularly day and night to mark the change of watch. It also housed two 12-pounder guns. Yeah, a 12-pounder gun would be a uh, probably the heaviest gun you will see on a land battlefield. Uh, there were six pounders and eight pounders, I believe, and twelve pounders. Twelve pounders was probably the heaviest you were going to see during this era, uh, in the Napoleonic era. And uh, yeah, pretty standard gun. And uh, yeah. All guns in this period were described by the weight of shot they fired. So twelve pounders fired a solid iron ball known as round shot that weighed twelve pounds about the same as a bowling ball. The Foxall also mounted two 68-pounder carronades. Uh, yeah, 68-pounders, uh, that, that's a really overkill. Um, and uh, a carronade, it's not even a cannon, it's a carronade at this point. And uh, these guns would be highly, highly inaccurate due to the size of the, of the shot used. 
but in close range it could be absolutely devastating. The carronade was another British innovation. A short, large caliber gun, fearsome at close quarters, but lacking a cannon's range or accuracy. The beak deck gave access to the bowsprit and the head, six outdoor toilets for several hundred seamen and marines, which emptied straight into the sea below. Oh well, very minimalistic design, but if it works, it works. The waist is where four of Victory's six boats were stowed. All large ships carried several boats. They were essential for ferrying men and supplies from ship to ship and ship to shore, for towing or turning the ship in adverse winds. Uh, yeah, and you still see this with large warships today, aircraft carriers and other sort, sort of uh, giant warships. They still require uh, towing ships to guide them out of port. And uh, I guess this is the equivalent. So uh, yeah, that's pretty interesting that uh, we're still doing that. And for launching amphibious attacks. The quarter deck was HMS Victory's command center and housed a total of 12 12 pounder guns. From here, the ship was steered using the ship's wheel. This was the responsibility of one of the ship's eight quartermasters, assisted by his mates. The ship's wheel was connected by rope to the tiller three decks below, which was in turn connected to the rudder. The binnacle, just four of the wheel, contained the ship's magnetic compasses and a lantern by which to see them. Cabins for the captain's secretary and the ship's master were located either side of the ship's wheel. Yeah, and you notice how many positions and jobs there are on this ship. Eight quartermasters to steer the ship, a, cab a captain's secretary and a shipmaster's cabin. I mean, we are dealing with the flagship, of course, of a an entire navy, so it makes sense. But you, you really do get to... A feel for how much administration is involved in running a fleet and a flagship of this sort. Each shared their small room with a 12 pounder gun. I'm sure that was very comfortable. The stern area of the quarter deck comprised the captain's cabins, a dining room, sleeping cabin, and at the very stern of the ship, his day cabin. All sharing space with four 12 pounders. Gotta cram as many of those as you can. The captain also had a private toilet, known as mm, the quarter nice. gallery. Above the captain's cabins, the poop deck. Now, the poop deck has nothing to do with feces. Uh, the term poop, in this sense, is derived from the French uh, le poupe, or le poupe. I don't know, I'm not French. I don't know how you pronounce that, but which in turn derives from the Latin poppins, which basically means the, the stern or, you know, the back part of the ship. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so it, it's a funny name, but in English, but it has nothing to do with uh, defecation or feces. Which provided good visibility and access to the mizzenmast. It also housed the signal locker, containing the colored flags used to communicate with other ships and shore. The Royal Navy's signals code had been recently revised by Admiral Howe. His system involved 14 flags, which could be arranged in various combinations. Now oh, I see the Danish flag is part of the um, the code. <laughs> it's pretty funny, actually. Oh, the Finnish flag too. I see. Convey 340 messages. That's For very emphasis, impressive. A gun might be fired. At night, signaling was by pre-agreed combinations of gunfire, colored lanterns, and rockets. You know, keeping track of the the signal codes and all the combinations must have been quite a, a thankless task uh, for the one who's supposed to interpret this. I'm sure they didn't have it all in their heads. I'm sure they had it written down in the book somewhere, but still. A Napoleonic ship of the line was, in essence, a giant floating gun battery designed to pulverize enemy warships 
and shore installations. Victory's three largest decks were all about her guns. As indicated by their name, the upper, middle and lower gun deck. The upper gun deck housed 30 12-pounder guns, 15 on each side. Forward in the round houses was the head for junior officers, rank bringing slightly more privacy and comfort. As it should. The sick bay was located in the forward area of the upper gun deck, as it got more fresh air and sunlight than the lower decks. Thoughtful of them. It was screened off from the rest of the deck by canvas partitions. The surgeon's assistant... Well, nice that they got some form of privacy. I mean, you don't want anyone looking at you all sick and battered and bruised. Whatever ailment you had. ...nicknamed Lob Lolly Boys for the soup they fed to patients, also slept here in their hammocks. HMS Victory was a first-rate ship of the line, defined as one that carried 100 guns or more. They were the most powerful vessels afloat, and so admirals often chose them as their flagships, the command vessels for a fleet or squadron. Several renowned British admirals took Victory as their flagship at various times, including Earl Howe and Earl St. Vincent. The most famous, of course, was Viscount Nelson. An admiral required his own suitably grand quarters, located in the stern section of the upper gun deck. These comprised an anteroom and a dining room, which also served as a meeting room. In the sleeping cabin, the admiral usually slept in a suspended cot. But Nelson preferred a campaign bed like this one, easier to get in and out of with only one arm. Yeah, that's a problem. You only have one arm. Uh, you're gonna have to make some uh, adjustments in how things are going to get around. And, uh, well, if this works, it works. And the uh, campaign bed, it looks good to me. It looks pretty comfortable compared to uh, everything else I've seen so far. <laughs> At the very stern lay the Admiral's day cabin, which served as his office and private space. The Admiral would spend much of his day here, submerged in the meetings, paperwork and administration required in the running of a fleet. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, the same as in any organization, especially military one. Um, the various land armies of Europe, especially Napoleon's army, was incredibly sophisticated with its administration and organization. And it would be the same out on the sea. And you have to coordinate movements, you have to draw up plans, where are we going, what are the plans for this particular engagement we are about to fight, or uh, who is going to be the captain of what ship, and all sorts of appointments and stuff like that you'd have to do. So, uh, you know, it's a, a thankless task, but somebody's got to do it. The Admiral's cabins, like all cabins on the gun decks and quarter deck, were formed by removable wooden panels. This meant when a ship cleared for action before battle, the cabins could be rapidly dismantled and carried with furniture and personal items down into the hold. Now that is uh, pretty smart, actually, which uh, allows the gun crews and, uh, to operate without uh, any hindrance. And it, uh, you know, gave some space for the cannons to operate in. You know, they had recoil, <laughs> if you didn't know. So uh, this is pretty interesting. And so you could have the best of both worlds. You can still have rooms and uh, privacy uh, for the officers, at least, while still uh, being able to operate at peak combat efficiency when the time came. The purpose of this was to allow the gun crews to work their guns without obstruction. The middle gun deck housed 28 24 pounder guns. Heavier guns were lower in the ship for greater stability. That makes sense. The ship's galley, a kitchen and giant iron stove, was where the ship's cook and his mates prepared meals for the crew. The stern section. Yeah, 820 men 
and you have to prepare a lot of food every day, especially if it's going to be three meals uh, per day, which I'm assuming it was. Um, because, you know, you burn a lot of energy um, working on a warship like this, especially if you are uh, one of the lower ranked uh, seamen. Uh, it was a lot of hard work, I can imagine. The was known as the wardroom, where commissioned officers dined and slept. At night, around 300 sailors and marines slept on this deck, their hammocks strung up between the guns. The deck below was the lower gun deck. This housed the Victory's heaviest guns, her 30 32 pounders. And at night, more than half the crew, around 460 men, slept here. Whoa. This plan of HMS Bedford, a contemporary third rate ship of the line, shows how crowded it could be below decks. Yeah, that does not look comfortable at all. I mean, uh, I mean, it sort of reminds me of the, the similar things you see when looking at how they packed slaves so tightly on ships. This is sort of similar. Um, obviously, um, it was even more horrendous for the slaves being transported, of course. I'm not making uh, any sorts of uh, relativistic comparisons here, but, you know. You understand where I'm getting with this. It looks tight. This far down in the ship, gun ports were usually kept shut because they were close to the waterline. With little fresh air and so many men living down here, the smells of the lower gun deck could be notoriously challenging. That's one way of putting it. The stern area, separated by canvas screens, was known as the gun room. This was where warrant officers dined, with screened off sleeping quarters for the master gunner, chaplain, and two junior lieutenants. They shared the gun room with the ship's tiller, a large wooden beam connecting the ship's rudder to the ship's wheel via a series of ropes and pulleys. The tiller is not currently in situ, but the strip of canvas marks its position. The beam would swing through the room when the ship turned so anyone dining in the gun room was wise to mind their head. That's gotta be so annoying though. And I imagine quite a few people uh, got hit in the head by this tiller uh, while dining. Uh, yeah. And not, not the most um, uh, comfortable dining room, I would say. Below the lower gun deck was the Orlop deck. A warren of small cabins and stores beneath the waterline, lit only by lanterns. The forward section contained storerooms and cabins for the bosun and carpenter. The more open area by the main mast was known as the cockpit, fore and aft. The midshipmen berthed and messed here, but in battle it became the surgeon's operating theatre. Yeah, look at those uh, surgeon's tools. Doesn't look quite... Uh, they kind of look uh, not so sophisticated uh, uh, and uh, brute force and they don't look all that clean. Uh, I, I know it's... Uh, I mean, they haven't been used for uh, centuries at this point, but still, um, I, I, uh, I do have to wonder about it whether or not they sterilize these things before <laughs> using them. Um, looks to me like these sort of tools would be used for amputations. I mean, that was pretty common back then. Um, you'd rather amputate because otherwise um, wounds would fester and get infected. So this was before the age of antibiotics and uh, well, we can all be happy that for modern medicine and uh, modern surgery. <laughs> At the Battle of Trafalgar, after Vice Admiral Nelson was shot on the quarterdeck by a French sharpshooter, he was carried down to the Orlop. Victory's surgeon was unable to save him, and this is where he died. Off the aft cockpit lay a series of cramped compartments including personal storerooms for the captain and first lieutenant, 
the steward's room for issuing rations brought up from the hold, the surgeon's cabin and his dispensary, and various other cabins and storerooms. Forward and aft, hanging magazines held ready-made cartridges for the guns sent up from the main magazine. The Orlob deck was surrounded by a passage known as the Carpenter's Walk, which gave the carpenter and his mates easy access to the ship's hull. And this, uh, they really thought of everything in this ship. Uh, it's a very impressive uh, and advanced piece of technology, really. And uh, yeah, I, sometimes, you know, um, when looking back at history and looking at all of these uh, buildings and the war machines, you're really struck by how impressive they really are, especially considering the technological limitations at the time. Uh, you know, we just still found a way to construct these impressive, um, impressive um, pieces of war, you know, war machines, basically. That's what it is. To plug any leaks. At the very bottom of the ship lay the hold, around 50,000 cubic feet, holding provisions for up to six months at sea. It was lined with 257 tons of iron ballast, to keep the ship stable. This was covered by 200 tons of shingle, additional ballast, which provided a stable bed for the ship's 150 gallon water casks. These alone weighed roughly 300 tons at the start of a voyage. Other barrels could- I mean, uh, that makes sense. Uh, you gotta have proper ballast in a ship of this size. Otherwise, uh, uh, you are not gonna be able to maintain stability of the ship in high seas. Contained 50 tons of salt beef, 50 tons of salt pork, and 45 tons of ship's biscuit. Yeah, I, I gotta wonder about the variety in their diet. Uh, seems like a lot of dry and boring food. Uh, of course, it's a necessity because refrigeration is not a thing at this point, and so if you want to preserve stuff, you gotta salt them. And salt them heavily. Various storerooms below contained items such as flour, spirits, tar, and paint. And that's the most important room, the spirit room. How are, there, how are you going to um, keep up morale without some spirit to lift the mood? The shot locker contained 100 tons of iron shot. Last but not least... Well, it seems like it's kind of hard to run, run out of ammunition here. Um, I mean, fleet actions uh, are significantly more rare than I think most people understand. It, it was very uncommon to have major ship battles um, like the ones at Trafalgar or the Battle of the Nile. Uh, most of the time you were out at sea patrolling or, you know, um riding the waves so it is, was um and it was rather uneventful the most vulnerable part of the ship the grand magazine holding up oh to boy. 35 tons of gunpowder in 784 barrels a fire here would cause an explosion that obliterated the ship and there are many many examples of this actually happening um I know the uh, Le Orient, uh, the flagship at the Battle of the Nile on the French side, it exploded, um, and I do believe it was the magazine that exploded. And uh, well, uh, in Swedish history, uh, which I'm more familiar with, we have the um, famous uh, ship uh, Kronan, which exploded in a battle with the Danes. And it was uh, quite an explosion, according to witnesses. And uh, yeah, you do not want to be on board when that happens. And anyone aboard. Or if water got in, the gunpowder would be useless in battle. Therefore, elaborate precautions were taken to keep the magazine safe. Including fire doors, fire retardant plaster walls, copper sheathing to avoid sparks, and keep out moisture and rats. The forward section of the magazine was the filling room. Now, luckily, uh, 
the Grand Magazine in this case is below the waterline. So the odds of it getting hit is pretty low. Um, or pretty high, depending on how you think about odds. But anyways, you get my point. Uh, there was not a great chance of the Grand Magazine being hit. But accidents, freak accidents do happen. So yeah, but... It's good that they took all of these uh, elaborate precautions. You know, you gotta do what you gotta do to minimize risks. Here, loose gunpowder was scooped from this powder bin into cloth bags to make cartridges for the guns. Lanterns were kept safely behind glass in an adjacent light room. Sensible. Until required, ready cartridges were stored in racks on either side of the filling room. In an age before steam or electrical power, all the ship's heavy lifting had to be done by manpower. Mechanical assistance came from two capstans, the main capstan and gear capstan. These were effectively giant winches, which extended vertically through the middle and lower gun decks. To turn them, bars were inserted into the capstan head, with up to 10 men pushing each bar. Using both decks, this meant 260 men were working the capstan for the heaviest jobs, such as raising the main anchor or hoisting a gun. The yeah, uh, I mean, like I said, this is the still... Uh, we are at the end of it, but we're still in the age of sail here. And so there is a significant amount of manual labor involved <laughs> when raising the anchor, for example. I mean, those anchors weigh several tons. And uh, you gotta winch them up from the bottom of the ocean floor. Um, so, yeah. I mean, uh, they sure, sure got their work out here. Work was often accompanied by a fiddler, a shanty, and the stamp of feet. Yeah, gotta raise morale. Victory carried seven anchors in total. The heaviest, the best power anchor, weighed four tons and was rigged at the starboard bow. The four tons, that's like, what, the equivalent of maybe three or four cars. Uh, modern cars, that is. So that gives you a sense of how heavy these things were. All power anchor on the larboard side was only slightly smaller. Sheet, kedge and stream anchors served as spares and for keeping the ship stationary in small harbors or rough weather. All wooden ships leak at sea, even before hulls are split by cannonballs or hidden reefs. Victory had four crank-operated chain pumps, which could pump water out of the ship at approximately 1,300 gallons per minute. 1300 gallons per minute that is a very impressive chain pump indeed um and uh, you know if we, you dealt with minor leaks um this would be good enough to keep you afloat uh, of course if you had a major leak um that that pump is not going to do any difference <laughs> about 300 jerry cans worth very impressive she also had two elm pumps for pumping seawater into the ship for washing and putting out fires. In the late 18th century, HMS Victory and ships like her were the most sophisticated and advanced machines in the world. Massive floating batteries that could remain at sea for six months or more and traverse the globe. In the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, they battled for naval supremacy, most dramatically in giant fleet actions. It was a contest that Britain won decisively. The consequences for Napoleon were disastrous. Yes, and uh, while we're talking about mentioning Napoleon, I might as well bring it up here, the fact that um, Napoleon uh, actually brought some organization and reforms to the French Imperial Navy, which uh, cleaned up the chaos left behind by the revolution. Of course, uh, Napoleon was an artillery man, not a navy man, and as such, some of his reforms were misguided. 
and perhaps not exactly what was needed. However, all in all, it, it was decent reforms. And uh, the problem for the French here at this point, after Trafalgar, is uh, they don't got enough ships, for one. Napoleon tried to rectify this with a massive shipbuilding program, and he used uh, ports that were captured during the Napoleonic Wars to do so. Uh, most uh, alarming for the British were the port at Antwerp, uh, which uh, was described sort of uh, having a gun to England's head by uh, someone I don't remember quite, uh, but was someone high political figure in Britain. And, uh, and Napoleon initiated a very ambitious shipbuilding program and uh, using the entirety of the resources of the French Empire. And uh, he also used the port at Venice. And Venice, of course, is, uh, had a long-standing tradition of building ships at this point. And so Napoleon was not, um, was not doing nothing to rectify the situation. The problem is building big warships like this takes a lot of time. And uh, even longer, you need experienced crews and experienced leadership. And uh, that was much harder for Napoleon to acquire. But all in all, he was moving in the right direction. And uh, by the time that the Napoleonic Wars ended, he had uh, produced quite a few uh, new ships of the lines and frigates. And with time, uh, this shipbuilding program would eventually eclipse the Royal Navy. It was, it was simply a matter of manpower and resources. Um, Britain wouldn't be able to keep up. But fortunately for them, um, Napoleon didn't get the chance. Uh, he, didn't, um, he didn't have enough time, basically. Uh, he ran out of time when the Allies... Um, started winning in 1813 and 1814 and the Allies captured all of these ships and ports so those plans ground to a halt but still it would have been interesting to see if the French could have made a comeback but uh, the Napoleonic Wars and how it ended in total defeat for France put, a, put an end to any ideas of France reclaiming naval supremacy and it would take uh, quite a while before France was a serious naval power again but for all victory's qualities, it was not ship design that gave Britain the edge in the war at sea. It was the men who sailed her. Definitely. British commanders and crews were experienced, capable and aggressive. Oh yes. In the next video, we'll see how they sailed and fought a ship like Victory. And how they lived aboard her. Our deep thanks to the National Museum of the Royal Navy and HMS Victory for their help in making this series. Victory is now embarking on an exciting new phase of her long and dramatic history. A major 10-year conservation project to ensure her survival far into the future. The work is guided by the latest scientific and historical research and will involve removing and replacing rotting timber and other structural repairs. And the great news is that the ship remains fully open to visitors throughout. Visit during the project, and you'll even get to see conservation work up close, with expert shipwrights on hand to explain what's happening. Yeah, big shout out to all the conservationists out there who do an absolutely fantastic and fabulous job in preserving historical relics, such as the HMS Victory here in Sweden. We got the famous Vasa ship. Um, she is of the 17th century design, so she's older. And it uh, sunk on her maiden voyage due to architectural problems. They could have used Sir Thomas Slay there. Uh, but it's an extremely impressive warship, now preserved for all time in the uh, Vasa Museum in Stockholm. So if you're ever there, go check it out. It's quite an experience. And... Uh, now they are also doing, uh, they've also been doing conservation work to preserve it. And we've also been taking a lot, a lot of photographs from every possible angle. Uh, so that if by war or accident the Vasa ship would be destroyed, 
we would have enough material to rebuild it from scratch. So uh, yeah, and it's very, really good to see that they're doing the same on HMS Victory. Um, we don't got many of these beauties left, and they're worth all the money in the world to keep around for future generations. For more information and bookings, please visit historicdockyard.co.uk. All right, that was the end of HMS Victory, the Total Guide Part 1. If you have any additional comments or context you would like to leave, um, please leave them in the comment section below. I will uh, read and respond to them. And uh, if you like the video, leave a like and subscribe. You know all of this. And I'll see you guys with Part 2 soon. And until then.